Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good morning. I hope you're a little less wasted and hungover than I am. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about the uh, new queuing subsystem in OpenVSD, and there is something new this year. I tried to keep this short, so we will have a chance to finish in time and get lunch. Um, what are queues? Stating the obvious, temporary storage for packets, in this context at least. Um, that's usually just a chain of packet header and buffs. Again, stating the obvious. And uh, the classic way of processing this is uh, just first in, first out. Uh, before we go on, quick recap on how a packet goes through uh, the network stack. The uh, network interface card interrupts. The interrupt handler takes the packets off the Rx ring and places it uh, into the IP enter queue. This is assuming IPv4, of course. Um, after doing so, it schedules a soft interrupt. Eventually, we process the soft interrupts and IP enter dequeues the packets from the uh, IP enter queue, hands them over to IP input, which processes them one by one. Um, assuming a forward packet as usual, uh, it goes on to IP forward, which does all the route lookup magic. And eventually, we end up in IP output, and there we have the second set of queues we care about here. Um, it puts it into the uh, into the queues for the uh, next where we are going to send the packet out. Um, these are the two queues we really care about. I said the IP inner queue on the input side and the outbound queues on the interfaces. If you have tunnels and stuff, things get a little bit more complicated, but the idea is still the same. Um, all these queues are IF queues. The uh, structures in here, as you can see, it's really damn simple. <laughs> You have a pointer to the uh, head, head and buff. You have a pointer to the tail and buff, like the last one. You have a length. You have the maximum length that this queue is allowed to have. There's a counter for the drops. And uh, there's some magic for congestion handling that is not on topic for this talk. <coughs> As I already mentioned, the classic way of processing voice is first in, first out. Um, the other two methods that matter is uh, our priority queuing. Um, the idea there being that you get lower latency for important packets, where important depends on some kind of classification, of course. Um, all priority queuing really, really does is changing the order in which we process the packets on the queue. Um, of course, this is only really efficient when your machine is under load or your link is overloaded, because otherwise you're pretty damn fast processing them anyway. It's like to change lat latency slightly, um, but it becomes really important when you're overloaded, because then the higher priority packets are being processed, while the low priority packets are being, well, either processed late or actually dropped. The other part that people seem to care about, for reasons almost beyond me, is bandwidth shaping. <laughs> where you have to do a lot more work. There you actually have to measure the bandwidth taken up by a certain class of packets and uh, delay sending those out if you're exceeding the configured rate. And well, delaying makes things a little bit more complicated, right? So the classification I keep talking about, um, that's basically the decision how the packet should get queued and how it should be handled. Um, that is completely independent from the actual queuing. This is a very common misunderstanding. Um, classifying just marks the packets. So you can classify at a completely different spot than the actual queuing happens. Um, all, all we do in OpenBSD for, for the classification is mark the packets with the queue ID, which sits in the packet header and buff, uh, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the packet header in the MBUF that way. Um, on OpenBSD, of course, <laughs> we use PF to classify because that's really powerful and, and well, I might be biased, but I kind of like it. Um, the uh, actual prioritization or, or bandwidth shaping, of course, happens when we enqueue or dequeue. Most of it happens at dequeue time. Um, at enqueue time, all we have to do is to put the packets into the right subqueues. 
And uh, at DQ time, we have to process them in the right order. The right order is important for priority queuing. And at the right timing, that's important for bandwidth shaping. Um, this obviously can only happen around the, uh, around the queues, the F queues. And uh, prioritization is really useful on any queue in the system because, well, as I said, changes the order and affects latency. Um, bandwidth shaping is really only useful on the outgoing queues. Why would you do bandwidth shaping on the in, in, uh, inbound queues? That just doesn't make sense. There's another queue right behind it where we are queuing again, so there is no shaping going on, right? Because that changes the timing again. Um, the other point is that we only know the interface speed of the outgoing interface when we are actually on the outbound side of queuing. At the uh, IP inner queue on the inbound side, we have no idea where we're going to send the packet out. Um, you pretty much always want priority queuing. Why? I already told you it's only really, really useful when you are under load, either the machine being pretty much overloaded or the link. Um, but once you are in these overload situations, you really, really, really want the priority queuing. Why? You don't want to lose important packets. So what is important? Well, that's a different question, but there are some things that you really don't want to lose. If you run CARP, you certainly do not want to lose the CARP announcements. So if we drop the CARP announcements because somebody's doing so, so much downloading that, that, that your, your link is saturated or the machine is saturated, uh, and you drop the part, card packets, the other node does not see our announcements, thinks we are dead and takes over. But since we are actually not dead and still think that we are master, we have a master-master situation where both machines think that they have to forward those packets and, well, it's kind of obvious bad things happen. So you don't want that. Um, same thing is, tr is true for spanning tree. You don't want to lose those announcements. Um, the, uh, the other interesting case is uh, you don't want your administrative SSH sessions to suffer from some user doing his porn download, right? <laughs> um, so priority queue, it really is everywhere. The uh, VLAN header has a priority field and surprise, eight priority levels pretty much as everywhere. Each and every better switch has four or eight queues per interface and uh, they have very simple very limited classifiers. And uh, many of the better network interface cards also have multiple uh, send and receive queues these days for most send queues. And it would be kind of nice to be able to use that, right? What we have now for priority queuing and bandwidth shaping is all queue. What is all queue? It's a research project by Kenji Ocho. Um, that was actually his, his thesis uh, about 12, 13, 14 years ago. Um, this was developed outside the OpenBSD tree, uh, outside any BSD tree, actually. And uh, so he had to do it in a least intrusive way, which led to some design decisions that he had to make using that model that, that hurt us these days. Um, the primary purpose of our queue was not to have a queuing subsystem on the BSDs. The primary purpose was researching the schedulers. Like back then, this was all very shiny and new. Nobody was really doing, especially the bandwidth shaping. So um, he tried like 10 or 15 different queuing methods. And this is the reason for the, the, the all queue design as it is. Um, it's a framework with pluggable schedulers and pluggable anything. So there's an immense amount of indirections and abstractions. And uh, of course, that comes with the price. One, the code's more complex and two, um, performance really isn't all that good. Um, how does our queue work? It replaces the uh, struct IF queue with uh, a new struct called IF alt queue <coughs> that has its drawbacks that I'll come to in a little bit. Of course, you need new N and D queuing functions that actually do something instead of just processing the packets right away. And uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, separate if all queue struct, um, any, anybody here is familiar with the if.h macros? <laughs> yes, so, so you feel the pain. 
Um, they, are, they are horrible as they are. And, and even before all Q, there are two different versions. There's the IF underscore star, and there's IFQ under, underscore star. And now we are adding a third variant. Well, now, 10 years ago, there, there is the third variant for all Q. Um, being able to clean that mess up is one of the driving forces behind replacing all Q. Um, all Q must be explicitly enabled per interface. Um, once you enable all Q, what happens is that the N and DQ functions are being replaced. Uh, that's function pointer magic in parts. And uh, um, in, in all Q, as I already mentioned, we do the classification and configuration through PF since 2003 when Kenjiro Cho and myself merged all Q into PF. Um, these days, we have one priority scheduler in tree. Uh, called prick and uh, two bandwidth shaping ones. One's called CBQ, class-based queuing, and the other is, is HFSC, which I'll detail later. Um, initially, we only had CBQ. HFSC has been added later. So, all queue comes with some headaches, and they are not only related to what we did last night. <laughs> Um, the uh, separate IFQ and IF all queue structs really have drawbacks. Um, this means that each and every network interface card driver, which uh, was supposed to support all queue, had to be modified. Uh, to be fair, this had to happen even without the if all queue change anyway, because the old way was uh, just not just not designed for for uh, delayed sending of packets and. Uh, the uh, IP inter queue, like the, the input side, and all the other queues for tunneling functions and, and that kind of stuff, uh, are not all queue capable because they use the old, old uh, IF queue instead of IF alt queue. Um, the configuration got drastically simplified by the PF merge, but is still pretty complex. And especially for HFSC, nobody understands it. So um, that pretty much means that that. Kendrick and foremost myself screwed this up uh, 10 years ago. So be it, we'll learn from it. Um, even with the, the PF configuration side that is drastically simpler than the old separate or queue classifier that we had before, uh, it still is very, very complex. And there just is way too much overhead. Just by enabling all queue on the interface, you lose about 10% of forwarding performance, even if you don't actually do anything, just by enabling all queue. Um, that, that's because of all those interactions and, and, and abstractions. Um, there's just way too much code, extra code running. Um, to give you an idea, all queue itself is about 9,000 lines of code. And uh, the diff I have somewhere just to remove it is more than 12,000 lines of code. So, starting to replace that. Priority queuing is the, uh, the uh, simpler of the two. Um, the goal for the new priority cure was and is uh, it to be super, super, super simple. And uh, the overhead should be so low that we can just enable this unconditionally and run all the time. Uh, that is actually the current status. So that has been reached. Um, how do we do this? We modify the uh, struct IFQ, uh, the NQ and DQ macros and about a handful of helper functions, not more, so it's, it's very small and self-contained. Um, instead of one queue hat in the uh, IF queue structure, we uh, use an array of eight. No, this is not configurable on purpose. Um, they are dequeued in order. We start at zero and go down to seven, and uh, we take the priority value at NQ time from the uh, packet header. So that's the new IF queue. As you can see, all we really did is take the head and tail pointers and make an array of them. The rest remains unchanged. That's the NQ macro. Um, <laughs> it, it, it looks harder than it actually <coughs> is. Um, so the entire change here really is, instead of, of accessing the tail and the head directly, uh, we, we uh, access the array and just take the prior value from the packet header. So this is really simple and dirt cheap. I can't hear you. Um, that's on OpenBSD. That is very very simple. The kernel is mostly big locked. 
So for the moment, we get away with that. Uh, that'll change eventually, yes. That'll change eventually, but we're not there yet, unfortunately. Somebody wants to help with that, be my guest. A lot can be done, but just somebody. You don't need a lot. Uh, okay. Well, you're apparently more into that topic than I am. <laughs> As I said, our, our, most of our kernel is still big lot, so we didn't really have to care about that so far, uh, at least not all that much. Um, Decuring is slightly harder, but again, the I should have shown the diff here, really. Um, the entire change here as well is just uh, access the, the, the array instead of the head and tail directly, and we do a little loop um, starting, starting at, at max pre, um, that's seven, and decreasing per run and, well, go down to uh, zero. Um, for the new priority period, there is no configuration possible on purpose. Uh, well, it's not necessary, right? Um, uh, just as before, we use PF for classification. Well, not that's another way, but PF is the main point being used for, for, for classification. Uh, example rules here, you match on something, and all you do is set prior to one of those seven values. Uh, the old way in all queue, using interface, interface queue, names, uh, queue names for priority queuing seemed to be a good idea back then. It has turned out to, uh, that it was not a very good idea. Um, the other way to, to set this priority is we actually inherit the priority on, on VLAN interfaces from that VLAN header. So if you already classified somewhere else and put the priority in the VLAN header, we'll retain that. If you want to reset that, you actually uh, explicit, explicitly have to do so in PF. And uh, in our stack, carp and spanning tree and a couple of other things, similar things, are prioritized by default. There's nothing you have to do about that. Um, that leads to priority queuing, but we uh, still need a bandwidth shaper, and that, unfortunately, is harder. Um, one thing's clear, we only need one. There is no point in having multiple. What's so funny about that? <laughs> um, HFSC is the most flexible one, also the one that used to be the hardest one to use, but uh, CVQ, can entirely be expressed in HFSC, so there really is no point to have a separate uh, CVQ scheduler. Um, the configuration, that's the challenge, because that was way too hard. Um, I haven't really seen any HFSC setups in the wild, apparently because, well, it's too hard to use. On the other hand, CVQ is being used a lot, so that's simple enough, but HFSC is the better scheduler in many, many, many ways. So the challenge is the configuration. Um, what's HFSC? HFSC stands for Hierarchical Fair Service Curves. curves. Um, a service queue, service curve, there's a bug in my slides. A service curve consists of a bandwidth called M2, a burst time D in milliseconds, and a burst bandwidth called M1. Um, what does that mean? For the first D milliseconds, a queue gets the bandwidth M1 assigned. We call this the burst bandwidth. And afterwards, it's the bandwidth M2. And uh, you don't actually have to specify the burst time and bandwidth, then there is no initial burst. And the burst bandwidth can actually be lower than the, uh, than the, the regular bandwidth, too. That doesn't make much sense, but it's possible. So an edge of a CQ consists of three of those service curves. Um, one is controlling the minimum assigned bandwidth. Like, um, as long as you make sure that, that the uh, sum of the, of the uh, minimum bandwidth specified for all the queues does not exceed the <coughs> interface queue, that is a guaranteed bandwidth. Uh, for example, to make sure that your VoIP traffic doesn't go under, under the uh, level where you can still hear the person you're talking to. The second one is the target bandwidth. That's what the scheduler tries to give you within the limits of the minimum and third one, maximum. So we have the limits and we have the target. Um, 
you will never exceed the maximum one. This also implies that there always is borrowing going on. So in HFSC, you can always borrow bandwidth from, from the parent queue if that has still bandwidth available within, as I said, within the limits. Yes. And uh, so just like CVQ, HFSC is a tree of queues. So everything has a parent except for the root queue. And uh, the, yeah, as I just explained, there's all this boring going on. So the plan. We want to use the existing core HFSC engine. I am not going to touch this for now because that task, the task of replacing the rest on our queue is big enough in itself. Um, there are some things that we'd like to do to HFSC, but that really is a completely separate job and separate task and to be done later. Um, we want to remove all the all queue glue because that's where we are losing all our performance. And uh, that leaves us three big parts that we have to do. Um, there's PF Kittle, that's being, well, PF being used to, to configure and set up everything. Um, PF Kittle, the, the config file parser, uh, has to be written for the new configuration language that I'll detail later. Um, of course, then there's parts in PF from the IO Kittles down to, to actually setting up the, the engines down there and the uh, marking of the packets as well, but that's kind of simple. And the third big part is hooking the actual engine into the N and D queuing. Uh, starting with that, hooking that in is actually kind of simple. All we do is add another two pointers to, uh, to our struct IF queue. Um, the HFSC IF struct contains all the information that HFSC needs to deal with that. And uh, the uh, the part that, that is actually uh, in charge of, of taking the packets off the queue at the right time is a token bucket regulator, so that needs some extra information too, isn't, isn't there. There is an idea to be able to use that separately to uh, just limit the uh, interface bandwidth. Say you are on a gig link, but you only want 500M. Um, I keep thinking that you shouldn't be, shouldn't be required to use PF for that. You should do something like IF config interface bandwidth 500M. Um, but again, that's future. Um, the token bucket regulator is the one that, that well, forms buckets of those packets and, and controls when they go, uh, when they're being dequeued. It doesn't do any bandwidth measurements or stuff like that. This is HFSC's job. And HFSC basically tells the token bucket regulator what to do and when to do it. The, DQ functions just look at that pointer to the HFSC struct. Uh, if it's there, HFSC is active and we have to call the HFSC functions. If it's not there, if it's null, we can't just DQ as usual and use our old scary macros. The PF Kittle bits, as I mentioned, this is the real challenge because, well, getting the configuration language right, that's really hard. Um, the first attempt we did in 2003 I'll declare this a failure. Um, as I said, I didn't find any HFSC setups in the wild. Of course, it apparently is way too hard to use. Um, the common cases, like as I explained, HFSC is very powerful, right? The C service, uh, service curves and all the little bits. But uh, in the common cases, all that people want to do is, is some kind of fair sharing of bandwidth between servers or users, right? So the common cases should be really, really easy and straightforward. You shouldn't have to bother with uh, service curves and burst times and minimums and maximums. Um, the more complex ones, well, we, we cannot make it simpler than it can be, right? But um, it should still be reasonably easy. And uh, as usual, as always in PF, we want stuff to be readable. If you, if you speak English and read a PF rule set, you should be able to understand this even if you have never touched PF before or if you have some kind of network knowledge at least. How does that work? Um, by me sitting in my cage, it doesn't. Very, very important part in OpenBSD, you sit down with the other developers, uh, either with a whiteboard or paper. Um, <laughs> the little shop in Japan put this right. Beer communication, that's what it's all about. I'm not sure what they mean by beer presentation for you, but that's just in Japan. Um, so 
We still want to have the queue setup and the classification in PF. Um, the classification remains what it was before. You just set a queue name. Um, if that queue actually exists on the interface we end up with, you can, you can do the classification inbound. If that queue exists on the outbound interface that we end up on, we'll use that and queue the packet there. If it does not exist, we'll just use the default queue, or if there is no queuing enabled for that interface, ignore it. The simple case. Now, this is our new configuration language that took us quite some time. Um, there's the root queue that does not have a parent, so that's the root queue on a named interface with a given bandwidth. We'll probably inherit the bandwidth that the interface is running on, but this is not 100% decided yet. Um, the, the, uh, the child queues um, explicitly name their parent and a bandwidth. Again, that's the target bandwidth. And it's a tree, so those two, uh, Buzz is a, is a child of bar, and you have another queue which is a child of the root queue. And there's one that you have to, to uh, mark as the default queue. Any packet coming in that doesn't have an explicit queue assignment goes to the default queue. So that's the simple case. Um, there is one button that you might need in, in certain, yes? So you say you have to have a queue at default queue. I barely can hear you. You said you must have a default queue. Yes. So in, you've got four commands here. Does, would it be acceptable to put them in an order, or do you have to put the default queue first? Because until you've said the default, you have no default. Again, I only got half of what you said. In your example here, you have four lines. Yes. The last one is the default. Is this a uh, this is coincidence. The default queue could be anything. Yes. So is there a default default? Is it the first one you give it? Until you mention oh, the default, which is um, default. That's an interesting idea. So for now, you actually have to specify default queue, but um, yeah, we could use the first one or something. Got to think about that. Good point. Um, in some cases, you want to limit the, the length of the queue. Um, queuing too many packets is not, not really a good idea. So um, whenever you re limit, reach the queue limit, packets are being dropped. Uh, dropping packets on TCP is a good thing, because that's the way to signal the sender to, to slow down. Uh, so queuing up a 1,000 packets in, in the most cases is a very bad idea. It's much better to drop one early to tell the sender to back off and send slower. So there you control the, the maximum length. Um, here we are adding our, our burst uh, bandwidth. Really simple, just add burst bandwidth for a couple of milliseconds. We are adding the minimum. Again, you can just give it a minimum bandwidth, but uh, you can also extend this. Uh, you can give the uh, burst, uh, the maximum, including a burst bandwidth. And quick question. For that uh, 100 milliseconds? Yes. That's 100 milliseconds out of what period? Infinity or hour or a second or? <laughs> that's the question I did, really didn't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because there is no trivial answer. Okay. Um, when the queue is entirely idle, you get those 100 milliseconds. If it has been running at, at, at the desired bandwidth, you don't get this burst bandwidth. And there is a fairly complex algorithm to decide on when it's idle enough again that you're eligible for bursting again. So a rule of thumb, if it's been running at, say, below 80% for, for a couple of seconds, then you get burst bandwidth again. Um, the queue assignment remains as simple as it always has been. Just give the queue name. And we are retaining the nice uh, prioritization of uh, empty TCPX and TCP load delay packets. Uh, basically, this goes back to uh, Daniel finding out on his DSL. Uh, I have a question for the previous slide. Uh, if you have multiple interfaces, how do you apply the same queue to the same? Um, 
the name internally maps to a unique ID. So we'll just assume we'll work with names. Um, when we hit the outgoing interface, we check whether there, the, that queue is there. If yes, we use it. If not, we go to the default queue. Does that answer your question? I think the question is, if you have two interfaces, do you have to duplicate all the key declarations? You can, but you don't have to. Oh, OK. So they implicitly map to additional interfaces. No, um, setting up the queues, that has to happen on a per-interface basis. Yeah. The assignment, the classification, is independent from that. Like it happens at a completely different layer. So we don't really, at classification time, we don't care whether we have that queue on the outgoing interface. So as long as you make sure that, that the desired queue has the same name on, on different outgoing interfaces, fine. And as I said, if it's not there, we don't go to the default queue. Okay, so, sorry. So you can declare two queues with the same name? Yes. Okay, that's, that's surprising. Is the Q keyword in pf.conf now mandatory? What happens if you define no queues at all? Uh, you don't have to. If you don't define any queues, there's no alternate queuing going on, and you uh, still do the, well, the prior queue is now always on, so it's not strictly FIFO anymore. But if you don't classify anything, the only things that are processed out of order are the, the few things that are prioritized by default, like carp and spanning tree. So if I don't have a queue foo on the output interface, it'll just fall back to the default queue? That's right. Okay. So yes, it falls back to the default queue, yes. Um, the, uh, I'll quickly want to explain the, the uh, act and load delay prioritization. Um, this goes back to Daniel Hatmeyer 10 years ago, noticing that uh, when, when many people hit his web server behind his DSL line, his downloads were, were super slow. Uh, looking at why, he noticed that, that his, the, the TCP X were delayed so much that his download speed went down because, well, the other side only sends you new data when you actually acknowledge what you have received uh, in the window, right? So um, we kind of want to, to prioritize TCP X that does, do not have a payload. And the same is true for packets marked as, as low delay uh, using the type of service. Um, the way to do this is you give it two queue names. Everything goes to that, the, the first queue, full in that case, and TCP X that don't have any payload and packets marked as low delay go to the second queue that you preferably prioritize over everything else. Outlook. The picture is actually from Canada. <laughs> the simple priority queue is committed and in tree and it's even in 5.1. I don't really remember when I committed this. I think it was after 5.0. Um, there is going to be a slight syntax change. So if you use that already, don't come and whine when you have to modify your pf.conf, please. Um, the bandwidth shaper is work in progress. What I have is the entire userland part, the, the configuration language, as I said, that was a big challenge. I have all the, the low level stuff, have the engines hooked in. What I'm missing right now is just some glue between the IO kiddles and setting the engines up. Um, this is a fairly big task. The diff as it is, is at 4,000 lines. And I estimate there's about 1,000 more missing. For some reason, I seem to be incapable of making diffs longer than 100, but shorter than 4,000 lines. I don't know why. <laughs> I keep ending up with these big, messy diffs. Um, the ability to, to watch the queuing in action um, that is in, for, for a queue that's in tfkiddle and sysdat, that has to be adapted, and I really hope somebody else does that for me. Uh, the plan right now is to have everything ready for the 5.3 release. Yes, this is one year from now on. This will take some time to get right. Um, since people keep whining on me when we change things in PF, there's something new this time. We'll keep all Q around for a release or two. Unfortunately, some keywords clash, so we will have to make adjustments <coughs> Um, the way we are going to do this is to uh, rename the clashing keywords for the existing all queue. So all queue users will have to modify their pf.com slightly, but this is really a set job. We just rename queue to all queue. This is one example, the most prominent one. 
And as I mentioned, this being a big target, once we got rid of all Q, we can finally clean up that if.h mess, and we hope to make it really nice and shiny. But, well, that's the future. Why not rename it to alt Q instead of old Q? Fun? Why not rename it to alt Q instead of old Q in the functional name? Because that is an existing keyboard. <laughs> I think you were first. You said a while back that there's now eight Qs hard coded. Yes. Yes. You also said that you inherit those priority definitions from what I think I took to mean the dot one P tag. From the VLAN header. Okay. Is this not going to cause problems since there's no switch in the world that uses that priority order? Well, they all process it in the same same way we do. No. One comes <laughs> one comes before zero. What? How did that happen? I missed that. Uh, welcome to the Arctic League. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Zero is, uh, sorry, one is background traffic, and zero is a best effort traffic. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to reconsider the in inheriting this from the VLAN header then. I, I really missed that. Uh, Exactly. It's not, yeah. It's not. Yes. So we have to change the inheriting. Right now, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, and we'll have, we'll have to have a little mapper table or something. Okay. Uh, let Let me quote Theo here. Not enough X murders at ITF meetings. Sorry, but every layer two network. No. Thanks for pointing this out. Because as said, I missed that. Most layer two networks use a slightly different customized mapping. Awesome. Why make things simple when you can have them complex and hard? <laughs> Next, next of you going to an ITF meeting, please take an X. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Committee meeting deciding on, on what we suffer from. They got closer. It's all, it's all in the right order now except for zero and one. Okay. Good. So it's a simple mapping at least. <laughs> I'll change that right away. Uh, I didn't do that yet because the code's not actually finished. <laughs> I, I plan on doing that. Um, getting getting dominant in makes that task even even bigger than it already is. We might look at that in the future. Why do you think so? Because uh, I, when I when I ported to Linux and to Windows, it wasn't such a big thing. Uh, you only need to look into the packet filter or something to if you want to switch to React. Yeah, you only need so to. Really yes. Uh, <laughs> telling t telling you news here. Time's limited, so. <laughs> Can't do everything at once and can't do everything I want to. Okay. It, it's a matter of time of realization, as usual. No, I, the, the question was why you focus on, on this task instead of uh, taking the other one? Because we want to get rid of the mess in, in if.h and taking, the, taking parts of what we already have and redo all the glue around it is easier than starting over completely. Might do that in the future. Not yet. I mean, you can definitely tell TCP, for example, if you want X, do one step make more, have more, one step more priority than the non X. Yeah. 
we'll look into that, one thing after the other. That's right. Um, even, even though you're saying that you don't want, you don't want to support that, you want to be classified. Oh, no, actually, we do support it. It just doesn't make sense. Right, what I'm saying is there are, there are, there are lots of valid uh, deployment mo uh, models that use uh, balance shaping to support the idea that you don't want to Congratulations, you found a case where it does make sense, right, so apparently. I'm just, I'm just putting it out here. So it's a, it's a well, a side effect of just modifying IFQ is that it works everywhere where we're using IFQ, right? And this, yeah. is, this is one of the advantages of this approach over the separate uh, struct IFRQ that made our stack not exactly easier to follow and read. So, so, so this, this will just work. So the second thing is, is um, can you go back to the early slide where you actually did the IFNet DQ? I suppose it's a brief quick look at it. Yeah. Okay, so you're looping over that each time to pull a frame out, right? So I'm just wondering when you pass this through a profiler, whether you're going to spend a whole lot of cycles going over the first six entries in that queue fighting the null. I took a shortcut here. In the places that really matter, this is processed slightly different and more efficient. Um, I mean, this takes off one, but of course, in the in the uh, DQ functions from, say, IBN or queue, we, we loop over the queue anyway. So we just modify that queue. No more questions. So you are shy. Oh, one more. Not strictly about what you were talking about, but you touched on it. The act prioritization. Is there any need for that if you've mitigated buffer bloat in your upstream if you? pipe? If you've mitigated buffer bloat in your upstream pipe, is there any need for that? Although, did someone say buffer bloat, not buffer bloat? Yes, God damn it, we all have to drink now. <laughs> <laughs> In a, in a perfect world, you'll probably get around without act prioritization, but we don't live in a perfect world. Well, but I think it's actually more functional because uh, you want your acts to definitely go through and you want them to be prioritized higher. You don't care if, like, if you have a HTTP download in the upstream direction, which is just going through your pipe, uh, it's like if it, it's essentially blocking it. Uh, if you can somehow figure out a way how to sneak those acts in, then you get the benefit of both worlds. That's exactly the use case, yes. Can we, can we defer a buffer blow to yeah, the I bar? <laughs> okay, that's it, I'm done.